Recording is on. Well, welcome everybody. So today I'm going to be having a talk with um, Ramsey Dukes, or um, real name Lionel Snell. And uh, let me just read uh, an introduction from from your website. So Ramsey Dukes is the current and most well-known pen name of Lionel Snell, the contemporary English magician, publisher, and author on magic and philosophy. Lionel uh, was born in Gloucestershire in the Cotswolds, and um, you attended uh, school in Bristol, and then you got a scholarship to Cambridge University. But your uh, main interest is in cults. You just did a few videos on cults. And um, are you a magician or just interested in magic? Um, but you're, you're well known in uh, chaos circles and and magic, is that right? Yes, I'm um, I'm very much out of the scene down here in South Africa. Uh, when I was in England, you know, I was involved with various magical groups and things like that, um, and did a certain amount of practical magic. Uh, the main thing that uh, I was known for was having done the Abramelin operation, which is a very famous magical retirement, um, which requires six months of dedicated application. So. Um, and also been a member of um, things like the OTO and IOT, uh, which are magical orders. But um, at present, I'm, I spend more time thinking about magic and sort of living magically rather than doing magic, if you see the difference. Hmm. Yeah, so um, you, I uh, was really fascinated by the videos that you did on cults and I, I, I think I see cults the same way as you do in fact I've seen so, such mm. a resonance between I think that yeah. um, mm. you know I thought you said that there's still a bit of difference between the way we think to make an interesting conversation we don't absolutely mm. gel on everything so so where the differences do you think between us or well, we both made videos by the way for, for the audience yes. yeah. on how to start a cult with the expectation that cults are not always the evil <laughs> things that mm. the general public thinks they are. They, yes. you know, it's very nuanced. So. I think the, the main point I sort of made in my thing about cults, well, I looked at a couple of particular ones as examples, but it's that um, people are horrified by the idea of cults and really frightened of it. Um, it's actually a very natural, fundamental part of human nature to sort of group in that way. Um, and one of the sort of the negative sides of it is the best way to group is to have enemies, you know, to have people outside the cult. And then that makes it into a, um, a really unites the pack together, if you like. And so this is a something that's very natural, which, of course, in a way makes it more scary because you think you oh, I'll never have anything to do with that. Well, actually, you're probably part of some sort of cult anyway. You know, you've got a label. You see yourself as different from other people. It may be, you know, like me, you've been to... Oxbridge and so you know there's the Oxbridge types and there's the rest of the world you know it's sort of all these things are, are cults at some level um, but it's true it can become very unpleasant and there are many examples of that on Netflix of that um, and that's what people are so fearful about um, but I pointed out you know that if you look at what actually happens when a young man joins the army um, very often um, coming from a rather low point in his life, you know, he doesn't know what to do and can't get a job. Um, step by step, it's very much what the very worst cults do. But the point is people understand the army. They think they know all about it. So they don't see it as a cult. But uh, say this sort of um, grouping is actually very natural to human beings. So in a way, it's important to understand it and, and know how to deal with it. You know, to recognize at what point it becomes harmful. Yeah, so I was in the uh, South African Air Force, so I was basically drafted and became an officer. So I went through all the training. And when I went through the training, I was in a cult in South Africa, a branch of a cult from, from the UK. Um, and as soon as I was in there, basically I realized that I went through kind of English public schooling that's you know for American viewers that's private schooling <laughs> yeah. and the school was designed pretty much on the old 
grammar school system. Basically, it comes from our research didn't find where did this abomination came come from. It came from Wellington. It was basically from Wellington. who said that um, Napoleon was defeated on the playing fields of Eton. And oh, yeah. the net result was they reformed the whole <laughs> school system in Britain so that they could churn out, you know, Wellington armies that could beat Napoleon's. Oh, yes. And so I was. Was it Wellington uh, you, know, you went to? Tail end of that legacy. Yeah. No, not Wellington. Was it no, no, because cool? it was on no, the no, model no. of of you know the Duke of Wellington's <laughs> yeah. idea of how yes. uh, you yes. know the, it's rediscovered. You know, Baden Powell rediscovered as the Boy Scouts, but it's the same the yeah. same thing. It's just yeah. making cannon fodder. <laughs> and and well, so I realised that you um, know, from the schooling. Was, mm. uh, I'd say my school was Clifton, which was another one of those Victorian schools, you know, founded on probably the same principle. And our great hero with a with a, um, a statue was Earl Haig, you know, it, <laughs> which <laughs> so that fits the mold. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, we we had a a more you know South African band, so uh, it was. Um, Cecil Rhodes was was oh, yes. was one yeah. big figure, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, and, and so it left me in no doubt that that that's all these things are re, being recapitulated as as cults that people just don't don't realize it. Mm -hmm. But um, once you start to realize that everything's a cult, then it gets a little scary because there is a tendency, I think, for for cults to become um, you know doomsday cults. They they do become snuff cults in in general. I mean, even a, even an army is is heading that way <laughs> in some respects, yeah. and the, it's all about death. You have to have a you know a doomsday deadline, a threat looming over. It has to be some kind of extinction looming over, and then the narrative is normally we're going to save you from that extinction, and it's exactly the same in the army. We have you know the communists are coming with <laughs> you know yes, I went yes. in the yeah. army during the Cold War. And then it was going to, we were going to fight off the communists and save ourselves from yeah. annihilation. Yeah. Um, mm. Yes, yeah, see, um, just uh, on the lines of what you've just been saying, if you're in the um, South African Air Force, um, my in-laws uh, were communists in South Africa, working with Nelson Mandela and Becky and people like that. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think my father-in-law... Um, uh, had a, a sort of a medal for the hero of the Soviet Empire or whatever they called it um, because of his work with that and founding um, or helping found the MK unit um, uh, and so and so forth. So that was a cult um, opposed to the cult that, that you, you were in. So it's, um, uh, and they, they had their uniform. They had to dress in a sort of looking rather poor um, so they could identify with working classes and everything, the communists. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, I consider myself more on their side. I've never been a communist. I've always been more mm. of an anarchist. But mm. I, even though I was an officer, I, was really a, I really was an officer so that I could cause as much damage to the system internally. And I realized <laughs> the higher up you get. The, the more you, damage you can do. So I, I, I played with the system a lot. I, I, you know, just see what I could get away with. And it was kind of cut my teeth for, you know, working against the system from the inside. So, I mean, I would do everything from, you know, we had to say, be in charge of a, a drill squad or flight. And, uh, you know, you'd go running through the streets of Pretoria in the training ground or through military camps. And then I would teach them to sing these songs, you know, like, mm. and which was a rebel oh, song. Yeah. You could actually go to yeah. jail for singing in the streets. <laughs> but I would have these guys, you know, 200 guys mm. going down the street mm. singing this song. They didn't know what they were. Well, a few knew. A few knew <laughs> what I was doing. <laughs> and they mm. thought it was part of the fun. But mm. it's incredible how kind of self-healing a cult is because you would, you know, see colonels and stuff and guys and, you know, in, in intelligence and stuff that knew exactly what the song was, but they would just manufacture something in their heads that justified it. Mm. They would just say, oh, this is kind of like these guys are being the red team and a red blue team mm. kind of training yeah. exercise. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they would never think the, the obvious mm. that there is some bastard mm. undermining mm. the system. It's an incredible well, see, experience to learn. Well, one of the ultimate excuses is, well, you have to understand the enemy, of course, you know. <laughs> mm. But 
it, the, the work that our intellect goes through to justify the cult and to to heal mm. the cult and self, you know, basically to to just reinterpret reality according to the the egregore of the cult. It's an incredible mm. thing. So, yeah. But so well, moving forward from that, what what I came to the conclusion that you know the world is in deep deep trouble. Um, I'm a complete doomer these days. And I, I, I always had an idea, it's very optimistic, a very kind of pantheist. I think you're quite a pantheist too. Um, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yes, I am really. And I, well, uh, I, yeah, so I, so I, 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 I kind I, of thought we heading. Hmm. So overall, I'm agnostic because I, I, I don't have, um, yeah. uh, as a chaos magician, I don't have that crisp idea of truth and untruth you know the, the duality um but i have my inclinations and my preferences is definitely towards pantheism mm. yeah i think i'm in the same way so i i normally declare myself a militant atheist and i defend it on the basis that you know whatever you talk about as god or anything like that is is a you know, you manufacturing um a construct it's just a label you if if there is a god it doesn't fit into you know a word or anything like, yeah. or a thought so the yeah. mere fact you're talking religion and talking about yahweh was it's bullshit it's absolute yeah. bullshit and so you can yeah. shoot it down happily because it must be an uh, an idol right it was one sort of fundamental thing i've talked about in previously in my writings which might be good to bring at the beginning of this thing because it's sort of to me, it explains some of the oddness of cults. And that is, um, uh, I think it's Kuhn writing about science, said that a statement is meaningless in science unless it can be disproved. In other words, that's almost a definition of what science. So if someone says, you know, can science prove whether God exists or not? Well, there's no way you can prove that God doesn't exist by science, you know, because, OK, you might do some experiment shows you don't need God, but the God who made the world made sure that happened. You know, so, you know, basically it's meaningless statement. Does God exist? Well, now, I said the equivalent for religion, which is what binds people together, is not um, a statement a scientific statement has to be one that can be disproved. A religious statement is one that can be disbelieved. Now, that sounds a bit odd, but I gave the example. You couldn't found a religion on the basis that the sun rises every morning because it's so damn obvious it rises every morning. But you could found a religion on the belief that um, the only reason it rises in the morning is because our priests stay up all night praying for it to come up. In other words, there has to be something absurd in order to build a religion around it. And, for example, the idea that um, the workers could rule the world and still be workers. Um, the, uh, the idea that the most important thing in the world is getting a, a football into a net. You know, there has to be something silly that other people can disbelieve in. Otherwise, you haven't got a cult, you haven't got a boundary to it. And I think that's... Um, that's quite fundamental to this discussion, isn't it? When you think about how absurd cults are, I mean, like the flat earth theorists, well, that's you can make a cult of because it's so obvious to many other people it isn't true. You know, immediately you've got an enemy. And you, so, so anyway, I just thought I'd put that in as a, um, a, a fundamental property yes. of cults. Something absurd at the center of it. Yes, and, and let, me, let me expand on that and how deep, you were talking about how deep cults and cultish behavior go. I think it goes all the way down to the fabric of the universe. I mean, for example, you can see something like that kind of behavior in, in genetics. So, so I read a paper once about <clears throat> uh, the evolution of genes. Um, and when there's a speciation event, in other words, a split, like you have a split in a cult, one of the, the most rapidly evolving genes are the genes to reinforce the boundaries between the two species. You would think that they would be kind of compatible and there would be a long period where there would be some crossover and you could make mules and donkeys and horses and stuff like that. But no, the most fast, fastly evolving genes are the ones that separate the two species. There seems to be a deliberate impetus yes. that I don't think yes. biologists understand to evolve or to, to once they separate to reinforce that, that kind of separation, which is exactly the same as a cult. So this must be a very yes. deep 
uh, oh, yes. principle, yeah. even maybe mathematical. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting because I'd say I do have a sense, and I've expressed it by saying, you know, this is this sort of clubbing um, uh, pack instinct is very profound you know and dogs have it and you know it's, we're not the only species that have it but that's very interesting because it takes it back even a stage further it, mm. yeah and uh, just one stage before that the way i see the dynamic of cults is is it's kind of like the peter drucker thing it's you know the, it's the whole versus the part so i always come back to i have a kind of a systems view of these things i spent a long time working with systems and complex systems um, and especially numerical methods and computers. But one, one thing you come back to again and again is, is the whole versus the part. There seems to be something of the yin and yang of the universe. And a particularly important thing is the, um, the Kantian whole. So Kant said that a Kantian whole is, you know, the, 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 um, it consists of basically the parts contribute to the whole and the whole contributes to the parts. So in other words, the human body is a Kantian whole because each one of your organs can, you know, contributes to the maintenance of your body and your body runs around feeding the organs and doing all the necessary. Mm. So mm. It, basically they, they mutually support it and that's mm. a, a Kant's definition of, of an organism. So I think yes. it's the same with a cult. Is basically mm. the the members and the the subcults. I also th really think that cults nest within each other, so that mm. you, you know you oh, yes. like in an army you can get a platoon and you can get a lot of loyalty to the pl platoon or something mm. like or flight or but a mm. squadron. But they, they they always subordinate to the air force in general, and then it fits into the national yes. you know cult. Well. An and, obvious and so example. It, to, so they yes, become parts that support the whole, and then the whole supports mm. the parts. Yeah, go, go on. Uh, obvious example to me is you know you think of Christianity, and in Ireland you can have Protestants and Catholics killing each other, but if you get something like um, uh, um, an attack by Muslims, then suddenly they're all Christians. You know, <laughs> they're together um, against the Muslims, and um, uh, I almost get the same thing with. Um, all the religious groups against the atheists, you know, sort of suddenly they're all united again against the, the great enemy is the atheists. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's a layer, layering effect. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the self, um, versus other. So it's, it, it's, you know, it comes out in epidemiology and basically the, mm. the, the human, um, immune system is like, you know, it's still a mystery, I think, to, biologists and virologists is, is how the immune system actually determines self and other. Mm. And that's part of a cult is, is, is really splintering off from the main organism. That's the, mm. the main culture and making a subculture and then um, identifying and reinforcing the, the difference. So in, in, you know, creating a new sense of self around the kind of egregore mm. and then reinforcing that difference and opposing uh, the threat. So, you know, as you say, it, it's, it's malleable and whenever a new other comes out, then the whole system, you know, re uh, reorganizes itself to make this, you know, the self mutates mm. to face that opposition of another self. Yeah. But it's really just yeah. self against self, whatever you define mm. as self. Mm. On, um, you know, putting sort of on the thing of why is this becoming so important now? Um, okay, this is, um, you might not approve of an astrological thing, but you know, people talked about the, um, Aeon of, uh, uh, what's it, the age of Pisces, which is the Christian era. And they said, that one of the problems, fundamental problems of the age of Pisces is the opposite sign is Virgo, who um, is traditionally not uh, a virgin, but a woman who is independent. And so they said throughout the Christian era, the idea of a, a free woman who is independent and not linked to a man has always been a sort of shadow figure um, with you know witch burnings and that sort of thing. And, uh, uh, and what I thought is, well, if we're moving to the Aquarian age, the opposite sign is Leo which is very much the sign of the individual, the king in his own right, the thing. And so 
I, I predicted, I said, I think the big um, problem we're going to be facing is the individual versus society or the individual versus the group. And so I think it's something which actually I would suggest is of rising importance. It's going to be one of the biggest issues we're facing, particularly as there are so many mechanisms now for sort of uniting people, things like surveillance and, um, you know, social media and things like that. I think there could be a real crisis about, you know, what is an individual in that sort of society? Um, what does it mean to be an individual? So that's just, I put that big context to, um, to add to the discussion, if you like. Mm. Well, I totally agree, but I, w I would nitpick on one thing that might be important, and that isn't isn't Aquarius uh, the water sign. So it's it's more than the individual Leo against the group. It's mm. water's oceanic. It's universal. It's really the individual against the universe. It's uh, it's uh, the individual against yeah, everything, yes. and that's mm. kind of what we're talking about with uh, transhumanism and the danger, the looming danger for us as a society and a species is is transhumanism it's this idea that okay there is no god uh there is you know f uh, forget the mother goddess or anything like mm -hmm. aquarius you, it's just me and all that has meaning in this nihilistic universe is that i must survive i must become immortal and so it's mm -hmm. it's you get this transhumanist yen for you know eugenics and to genomics and uh, cryogenics and all these pathetic uh, sort of infantile kind of mm. attempts to prolong life which goes back to the epic of gilgamesh the epic of gilgamesh is the very mm. first um mm. work of literature in, in uh, that humanity has and that's exactly what the story is is basically gilgamesh the king is trying to become immortal because <laughs> He, he can't oh, come yeah. to terms with his own death, and so he's seeking immortality just like the transhumanists today. And of course, mm -hmm. it turns into a debacle, <laughs> which it will do again. Gosh, I wonder how that relates because, uh, you know, things when people say, Do you really believe in that? There are certain things that I need to believe in, and one of them is reincarnation. You know, if I can't have a second go. <laughs> but I wouldn't try to persuade other people it's necessarily true um, and so um, I find that quite weird actually I'm quite prepared to die as long as I got some hope of being coming out around again having another chance mm. well yeah so I've I've oscillated on this um, this idea of, of reincarnation I've, I've I've since come to the idea that it's a kind of a non question because you have to say, what is it that reincarnates? And when you start looking at what possibly could come back, you find that it's, it's a chimera. There really isn't, it's, it's a phantom. So it's, it's kind of like the idea of our individuality is just one small part of our brain that thinks in terms of ego. And so it wants to come back. And it's, that's the driving force uh, behind transhumanism. But it's it's ludicrous because it never was separate anyway. It's kind of like saying, you know, like some part of the ocean saying, you know, will, you know, will I be reincarnated? And it's not like, well, you're just water. It's just you never were separated from water. So yes, you never had any individuality to start with to say, does the individual soul come back? And so there never was an individual soul. It was just mm -hmm. a universal soul. So it's it's. It, when you come to define what actually gets reincarnated, uh, you know, you get to Cartesian dualism and stuff like that, and it just seems silly because, you you know, and, and you can also pin it down from the cultural point of view. If you go to, to India, you can shoot holes in, in all their theories of reincarnation because they just don't hold up to, to experimentation. One um, uh, sort of analogy I've used um, in some of my previous talks was um, the difference of, uh, in our society today, why people feel so insignificant. And the contrast I suggested was that um, in sort of feudal society, uh, people were cogs in a machine. And I give the example, you know, in a village, the swine herd is the lowest of the low. 
um, and he's got no chance of getting out of that because there isn't job mobility and things like that. He'll be a swineherd all his life. He's the lowest of the low, but he knows his position. He has a definite position, and if he wasn't there, you know, they would have to try and find someone to fill that space. He's a cog in a machine, and just as the squire, um, he too can't just decide he's going to give up being a squire. He's sort of locked into the system. And I said, nowadays, we're more like drops in the ocean. And I had that lovely picture, you know, of, of, of the ripples and one drop of water um, that had splashed up. You've probably seen a picture like that. And I said, if you look at that tiny drop of water, um, it's like a lens. And you can look into it, you can see the whole ocean through that little lens. It's like a complete microcosm of everything. And if you took that drop of water to the laboratory, you could find out all the properties of the ocean because you could test it, its chemical products and its quality and things like that. So that drop of water is like us now. It's like the microcosm. Um, I've got just as good DNA as Bill Gates. I've got just as good DNA as um, uh, Trump or anything like that. You know, uh, I'm as good as anyone. But the moment I drop into the ocean, I'm nothing. And that's why people feel so insignificant, you know, and the cult of personality is that uh, the cult of, um, what's it, fame, celebrity, is those people who splash up into the air and they're shining droplets, you know, and everyone looks up at them and thinks they're marvelous. Um, but actually, they're just the same as they are. Um, and people can feel so humiliated in our society, you know, and you think, well, no wonder someone occasionally takes out a machine gun and, and goes and kills a lot of people because for a moment they're the most famous person in, in, in the news. You know, it's that desperation to be that shining drop, that, that sparkling diamond before they just fall back into nothingness and um, that drip of humanity. And that seems to relate very much to what you're saying. It's sort of um, the desire to pull oneself out of that ocean. Um, and sparkle just yeah. for a moment. Yeah, the, the problem is it's the whole versus the part then. So a Kantian whole breaks apart as soon as one of the parts. I mean, if, if your liver suddenly wanted to be a celebrity on the best of all the organs and stuff and started being a hyper liver or a hyper organ or something, your whole body would be very sick. The, the whole yes, body politic yes. would fall apart. That, that's what fact, happened fact, after the, we, the medieval we, era ended. Mm. In fact, we have oh, a oh, just let me so finish this thought. Oh, yeah. Mm. Sure. Oh, uh, hold that thought. I, I just want to say that, that uh, King James said that at the time. He said this is a great breaking apart. When that ethos that you were talking about, the medieval sense of place, and that you were part of kind of Hobbes' Leviathan, then James said this is a time of a great disintegration. Everything is becoming separated. Um, and what he meant was individualized, yeah. Um, Sorry, to go, yes, go on. I, I was just going to say that um, we have a word for um, a cell of the body that decides to be creative and do something different, and it's called cancer. And that is um, why people fear the individual so much. <laughs> mm. Yes, but that's what's what's happening. We've we've been, you know, the body politic of yeah, they're just one of the problems. I think nobody mentions about this overpopulation is is that. The, um, there is such a thing as overpopulation, even though a lot of people deny it, because the body can only get the body politic can only get so big before it starts splitting into suborganisms mm. and uh, and disintegrating. And then those look, from the overall perspective, like cancer. It looks like a met metastasization. So, so we will be seeing more and more cults. I mean, Trump is a cult tr uh, cult leader. And I think even in Revelation, it's I can't remember a chapter and verse, but it says you'll know the end times are coming because there'll be lots of cults and new religions. Oh, yes. And and so yeah. what it means is it's a breaking apart of the, the old ethos, right? The old culture. Mm. Mm. The dominant culture mm. becomes separated into subcultures, mm. and that's what we're seeing, and that's what everybody's, you know, fretting about now. Yes. Actually, that might be a point to bring up. Remember I sent you an article which um, actually looked at the number of uh, what we might call traditional cults um, and the, the number had dropped. Um, it had, the, there were many more cults in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I think it was, 70s and 80s particularly, and the number had gone down. 
Now that didn't really fit my perception of you know the way society is is breaking up now, and I think that it's um, uh, my hunch was that actually it's the nature of cults has changed. You know, there are fewer it's exactly cults, what I thought. Yes, yes, that you could fewer some things you could say that is a cult which would be recognised by an academic. Oh yes, that fits all the qualities. But on the other hand, with um, uh, social media and that. In fact, there's a huge proliferation of what might call them mini cults. Um, they're large in numbers, probably more in them than, than in a previous cult like the Hare Krishna or something, yeah, because it's a global thing now. But um, there are so many of these small cults, um, each containing many people. And so it's the nature of cults is changing and in a way becoming more organic. Um, yeah. They can proliferate. That's exactly split. how I interpreted it. Yes, yes, that's exactly how I interpreted it, that article. I thought that basically they 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 missed that that old style of cults uh, fell into disrepute because everybody kind of it became a cliche, and so it, it wasn't really an operative model anymore. So people like Manson and things like and Jim Jones and that they all, you know kind of uh, brought that style of cult into disrepute. But cults never stopped. They actually increased. So, you know, then you got the cult of Jobs and, you know, Wozniak and stuff. But Apple is a cult. Uh, you know, and look at the cult of Elon Musk and the transhumanists. They're just cults everywhere yeah. now. So cults mm. redefine themselves. So you get like Kim Jong Un yes. and stuff in in Korea. He's a cult leader. I mean, mm. so is Xi Jinping. Mm. So is Trump. They're all cult leaders. Yeah, yeah. The um, there was a book I read um well, about ten, twelve years ago called The Culting of Brands. It was actually you know a book for brand and um, um marketing people, and it gave examples like um, BMW motorbikes versus Harley Davidsons. And how they made a cult out of their brands, you know, um, which was very amusingly illustrated in one of the books by um, a South African thriller writer, um, a very well known one, I can't remember, the name, where, you know, the. Um, uh, the, uh, the Wilbur Smith, right? Uh, Wilbur no, Smith. No, um, oh, no, no, no. Um, particularly, particularly police dramas and things like that. And, and cause South African. Um, intelligence services oh god what's his name he's really good if i can remember it i'll come up with it later but anyway in in one of these things um where there's a biker uh, a black guy who's ex escaping on a motorbike um and the police are after him well, word gets out on social media and so biker gangs go after him um to support him and on the one hand there's the bmw people and the other is the harley davidson people the Harley Davidson people say, "Oh, those being doubles, they're, they're useless. You know, they um, they're just lawyers and things like that, things like that." But of course, the BMWs were off-road bikes, so they had a huge advantage over. The, over the, so it was, you know, it was this sort of it played very much on BMW as the sort of the, the um, uh, you say uh, uh, seen not heard was one of their advertisements. You know, not heard. Whereas the Harley Davidson people, well, you know, are we're the, the we're the rough, tough um, biker gang. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, this book on um, culting of brands looked at people like that and like Apple and what they did to make their brand into a cult where people would stick to it. Even if they even if they produce a bad product, people would still defend it, you know. And, and, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. They, uh, that's called lifestyle branding. So that, that's the, the aim of people it's, it's like goop and Gwyneth Potter and so it's you have you you have this entire ethos which is is really just the merch for a cult and so you have you know this quantifiable identity or this uh, you know um, really uh, it's it's um, it's it's playing off exactly the thing as people's need to belong to something bigger so in other words it's a, it's a kind of a prison yard thing and you become, uh, you know, basically a prison yard is full of factions. You've got to make sure you get into the right one or the strongest one. And, you know, yeah. otherwise uh, you'll get you'll get uh, mauled as a as an outsider. So it, it's very much a prison yard kind of thing. I think we are all in a you know in this industrial society in a prison yard culture, and mm. and so 
it's uh, it's it's a gang culture, and it's exactly the same as when when things get a bit rough in society. It's important that you get you know become part of the biggest gang because you need protection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I th I think there's part of that is um, it's it happened in with the Muds and the Rockers too, right? They they were also oh, yes, became yeah. like the BMW and, and the Harley Davidson. It was uh, very important about what kind of bike you wore and what shoes you had, your haircut. Oh, yes, <laughs> it yes. became very yes. defining. A, you know? a, sc a scooter or a motorbike, you know, that was Mods and Rockers, wasn't it? A scooter or a motorbike. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly. But again, mm -hmm. it's it's um, isn't the motorbike? It's a symbol of freedom. And then it's mm. what's your particular brand of freedom? And it's so like, that, that's not real freedom. This is yes. freedom. And, oh, and that's, yes, yes. So that's part it, of the cult thing. It's basically it's your it's your freedom vehicle and it's your immortality mm. vehicle. So, mm. but, but have you, do you remember the, at, uh, the, the uh, can I just say, do you remember the early Mac adverts, Apple adverts, which showed a sort of um, 1984 um, dictatorial world, and then someone coming in and sort of throwing, I think it was a woman came in and threw something at the screen, and you know, Mac is releasing you, giving you from, from this tyranny. You know, sort of thing. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's and, and, its own but she was but, but she was dressed as, you know, basically with, as, as I recall, she was dressed with the leg warmers and stuff of the 80s, so it was basically saying, <laughs> This is you and your new cult, uh, which which they were just ripping off already from like Olivia Newton John and stuff. And then they were <laughs> saying like, and watch you break out. And, you know, she has a big hammer. She breaks and breaks out. In oh yes, a hammer. That was it. Yeah. And then what does it become? The cult. The cult. What does it become? It becomes the cult of Apple. Now, now mm. Apple is a closed system. <laughs> they, mm. you know, technically. Um, mm. And uh, you know, a Apple is a cult. That now we we have we tethered with our little Apple icons, mm. and they become you know like Elon Musk says that we are already uh, cyborgs. We're already transhumanists because we can't live without our phone, and that is true. Mm. That, uh, but it's uh, it's becoming a legal requirement. It's certainly a legal requirement yes. in, in like China. You can't go around without a phone, and and well, in, there was um, a group in. in I say in South Africa, you know, if I want to make a bank transaction, um, they say we've sent a message to your phone. Now, I'm in a three story building and I'm partly crippled. So I sometimes have to go up three stories in order to get my phone in order to complete the bank transaction. You know, it's, it's, um, it's almost like making it compulsory to have it. You know, you need it for so many things. Yeah, so uh, just let me get. Uh, so yeah, so um, oh yeah, I was just going to point out that we're, um, this is a uh, something which um, is is going to become very important because the in France there was a breakaway group, essentially a, a cult, um, and the reason why they uh, the the French police arrested them for being eco terrorists and uh, and what triggered. The f Interpol off was that they stopped using cell phones, so that was the trigger. They started surveilling them yeah. because mm. they stopped using cell phones, and then that they mm. they took that as uh, as a trigger that they're being radicalized and becoming dangerous. And I, I keep on bringing yeah. that up because it's so important for the world that's that's coming. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, well yes. so yeah. so much. So my stick and stuff, and my view of all of this is is that this transhuman world um, is terminal. It is. I, I mean, I can I can show with I believe I can show with mathematical precision, with the rigor of mathematics, um, that it it is uh, it is deadly. What they what the transhumanists are trying to do, and their their program is is a death cult. Um, they don't realize it now. They think it's an immortality cult, but it, it really is a death cult. It, I mean, it's it's obvious in some ways when they talk about saying getting immortality being uploaded to silicon. Well, silicon is dead. It's dead as a doornail. What they're saying is they want to be preserved as dust. and It's dead. They want to die, It's a, and they want to go to this stale, crystalline, dead heaven where nothing really ever happens. And mm. and they're taking us all there. 
that basically they will transform the living world into the dead world in this Gilgamesh type of immortality yeah. quest. Can I just um, ask, because you've talked about transhumanism several times, and um, I have a sort of vague notion, you know, over there. Um, could you just sort of define it a bit more clearly? Because I, I'm not so aware of, of, of this particular cult. Um, could you just ex explain it a little bit? Transhumanism. Who are these people and, and you know, what are they? So it's it's been a long creeping thing that's crept through the 20th century. It started off, mm. uh, well, it's always been there since, uh, say, the Hilbert program. So you, you studied mathematics, right? You, you remember who Hilbert was? Um, um, Hilbert I know Hilbert had this, Spaces, yes. Um, Hilbert Spaces. Yeah, well, so the Hilbert of Hilbert yeah. Spaces. Mm. Mm. Well, well, that Hilbert um, was, in his private life, was uh, this kind of utopian um, millenarian progressive. Uh, and these mm. guys all are that way. And so, so, mm. I mean, so, so what, they, what they're after in, in terms of chaos magic is they order. They represent mm. hyper order. So everything yeah, yeah. is about order, but it's too much order. It's the order of a crystal. So if you, you know, if you have a salt crystal, it's very regular, and it's also yeah. as dead as a doornail. As, as yes. a chaos magician, you know that life is chaotic. What represents yeah. life yes. is this mm. uh, chaos to infinite dimensions. And mm. so, so they think in terms of immortality lies in order. So uh, Jordan right. Peterson and stuff is, is on the brink of all of this. He just wrote, you know, he writes a lot about chaos and order, and then he did 12 principles for, you know, preserving against chaos. And now he's got, you know, mm. oh, actually, chaos has some upside. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, he's, he's going through all this yeah. very interesting, his transformation. But, um, yeah, in essence, what Hilbert said in the Hilbert program was, we're going to make life ordered, predictable, and therefore, uh, we can, once we have control, we can basically make sure we can get even control of death. And so uh, they started on making everything logical. So they, the, the way they were thinking was you could make an oracle machine and that would order human society. It, it's become AI now. And what they were thinking was, you know, with, with back to Bull and Babbage and stuff, he, he wanted to take error out of the logarithmic tables and then he made the Bull and Babbage, uh, the machine. Um, mm -hmm. Charles Babbage, and, and it was basically with steam precision. You could just crank out, a steam engine could crank out logarithmic tables and do differential calculations, and yeah. you take out all the human error. So the idea is you mm -hmm. take the humans out, you get mathematical and um, mechanistic precision, and then you bring the world under control, and that's how we get to utopia. And then they started on yeah. the Hilbert program. Hilbert said, um, <clears throat> you know, before we start this, they were logicians, you know, they use, use things um, like Pino rhythmic Mitic and um, uh, Zamilla Frankel set theory. And so they started on this thing saying everything will be logical, human society will be ordered so that as long as you give the right information to the mach machine, it can do politics, you can take those stupid, you know, frail humans that are so flawed, take them out of politics, you could replace judges on the with a machine, you just put the, the right um, data into the machine, put all the evidence of the case into the machine, and it would come out with an absolutely logical and rational verdict. And our whole society could be ordered that way. And they started this on this big program. They didn't. They weren't explicit about that's what their aim was. They were kind of uh, uh, kept it under the wrap. But somewhere along the line, one of the guys said, "Well, I think it was Hilbert himself said, before we do this." Because we're mathematicians and we need real rigor, we must establish that the logic itself is consistent and complete. And all the mathematicians oh, yeah. howled and said, of course mathematics is logical and complete. Mm -hmm. said, well, well uh -huh. yes, but somebody, if we don't actually nail this down, somebody is going to come up in a court case and say, look, I reject the machine. Because basically your logic is not complete or it's not consistent. And we say we oh, must yes. prove by first principles that it is. Yeah. And yeah. so he and hence the girdle, all the mathematicians said this is a complete waste of time. 
But he said, well, we must do it just to, for mathematical rigor. And so he put out this mm -hmm. challenge to say, can, to somebody who said, can you prove that logic itself, that we, rationality, everything we're going to run the new centuries off, is it consistent and complete? Well, it came back from Kurt Gödel by 1930, was mm -hmm. said like, mm -hmm. no, logic mm -hmm. is incomplete or inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And then, then, oh, then there was also another piece that was the Unshiding's problem. He was saying that, mm. can you prove that all problems are decidable? So in other words, you couldn't, you know, the, it would bring the law into disrepute if you came to this oracle mm. machine, somebody brought a legal case, and they said, no, this case is undecidable. And they said, well, why are the other cases decidable? Screw that. I don't mm. want this legal system. Mm. In it. So, so they had to say yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, consistent, complete, and decidable. And then Turing came back in 1934 with a seminal paper that said, you know, basically, not all problems are decidable. You can have true statements that uh, cannot be proved. Um, and and yes, so yeah. that was the end of this idea. Mm. But it didn't die. It just transformed oh, no. itself into the computer. It led to the cyberneticists, the Macy Foundation. Mm. They carried on on this idiot program. And, and it's from the cyberneticists. They, they, they basically eugenicists, right? It, Oh, yes. uh, yeah. Most people think that eugenics went underground after Hitler and the war. It didn't. It went into genomics, and basically, it's yeah. it's resurfaced now in the you know the One Health doctrine and the WHO and all these guys, um, and particularly Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset. Yeah. So they've all inherited this long mantle from you know that goes back really very far, um, and into prehistory, in fact, and the, but. That they still on this disproved program that Kurt Gödel and, mm. and Alan Turing buried it, and they ignored yes, that. Yes. And so we carry on into this this world that is going to kill us all, and it's going to kill us all because, you know, if you manage systems that way, they become Byzantine, and when they become Byzantine, they break down. There's no way mm. eugenics could work because it it makes a monoculture that's mm. vulnerable to chaos, to disease. It becomes like the Irish mm. potato. The Irish potato was too pure. Basically, it's just a mono monocrop, monoculture. And what yeah. that's vulnerable to is chaos okay, in the form of disease. Yeah. So, sorry for that long yeah. explanation, but no, this no, is crucial actually, that's, to that's the whole. That's very helpful because, yes, because I was aware in the 60s um, when computers dropped analog computing. Um, and I felt they dropped something very rich there. Because analog computing is a oh, continuum, yes. it's, um, and so it's richly complex, and um, it's good at certain handling certain things. Now, what they said: oh, digital computing can model the analog thing, but of course, it does that by reducing it to a countable number of particles or objects. You know, it's countable. Whereas analog is dealing with a continuum, which is uncountable, which is not just bigger; it is vastly bigger. Um, and that really was the problem that um, uh, the Greeks faced because they had a completely logical um, uh, system of atomism, you know, that, and they called it the, the, the rational universe, you know, that, um, uh, and the mathematicians gave them this problem. They said, well, if you've got a, a square, which is a, a billion atoms by a billion atoms, how many lie along the diagonal? And you found that no matter how small the atoms were, you couldn't get a whole number of atoms along the diagonal. And so they had to admit there's another type of number called an irrational number. And um, uh, the shocking thing was it isn't just that our rational world has got a little bit of irrationality in it. The rational numbers are so many more numerous that actually our rational world is like a little, little leaf floating on an ocean of irrationality. And so it's a similar sort of thing, you know, that um, trying to reduce it to... Um, individual steps in a, a digital computer as digital um, when actually uh, the reality is analog as far as I'm concerned you know the huge complexity of analog and you can do very useful things by making little digital simulations but to think they represent the whole is ridiculous to me yeah, I'm absolutely you do that on the same page with you. And I thought exactly the same thing about analog computers. So the mm. funny thing is, during the 80s, there, this was pointed out 
there's in fact there's this kind of history of point, showing up the bullshit of this digital world and using you know basically these ways of framing things and measuring things and being scientific and there's this tradition of uh, you know people coming up and saying this is bullshit all the way back from um say uh you know the paradoxes in ancient greece like zeno's paradox he was saying you know you guys trying to digitize stuff doesn't work and he showed zeno's paradox those kind of things that showed you you can't make the continuum discrete and and they just swept it under the rug they swept under the they tried to sweep irrational numbers out of the rug and in the 80s yes. it came up yeah. again it came up again mm. with 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 chaos theory funnily enough Mm. And these guys, like Lorenz, said, what you're doing cannot be done because of the precision problem. It's saying the butterfly mm. effect. If you mm. try and measure yeah. society, you have to average. Mm. You, you don't have nature's um, basically infinite needle that can go to any resolution. So in other words, mm. you have to say that on average, we get this effect. And that averaging mm. then is hiding a butterfly effect. And what Lorenz said mm. was, you know, no matter how many decimal points you take your numerical method to, it will fundamentally change the result further down the stream, and it's unpredictable. The butterfly effect is unpredictable. So what these guys are doing is trying to put nature in a box, but it cannot, you, you know, the box has dimensions, and those, it will miss all the butterflies in that box, and chaos will bubble out to destroy the, the whatever program that they have. And yeah. that was, uh, you know, everybody heard about tipping points and chaos and Lorenz and all that, and it was all swept under the rug. And the next thing you know, Charles oh, Schwab yeah. is talking about AI and how we're going to manage society, exactly how we mm. said it couldn't be done. Yes. Okay, can I, I'd just like to qualify um, what you said. I agree with it, certainly as overall. But you said um, uh, at one point something like, you know, this, this fragmenting digital thing doesn't work. Now, the problem is, it does, it gets brilliant results. The thing is that um, this is what politicians know. If you dumb things down, you can actually get dramatic results, you know, um, like Brexit and, and Trump. Um, and so this sort of, this process of dumbing down to digital has actually produced amazing results. But the point is they only go so far, you know, there's a limit to them. And that's the thing. So that's unfortunately the thing that, you know, it's not easy to say this hasn't worked because people can point to all the different things, you know, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this. But the point is that they, they have their limits and, and, you know, they have their weaknesses, but people are dazzled by the successes. Um, hmm. Ah, that's so good you brought that up. Yeah, that was really something that I alighted over. And so, but it's, it's really exemplified by uh, forest management in Germany. Mm. found was they, they said, we want to maximize the output from a forest. So they went and they analyzed all the, uh, the types of soil and which trees grew best and then matched the types of trees to the, the soil, made it all rational. Mm. And they got tremendous results. So basically, the, wood, the, the lumber output mm. from the forest was fantastic, mm. but it tailed off after about a hundred years. Of the forest, it's been completely deforested. Uh, yes. What they didn't yeah. understand, what they were doing was they were breaking up this complex um, biome mm. that communicates through the soil with mycelium. And what they did by separating the best trees to the best soils and doing this kind of apartheid, um, forestry apartheid was it, it worked for a while, but they were kind of mining the soil and they were creating all these peripheral things like the, the bugs then the, became, mm. uh, you, you see, most of the trees were protecting each other by this kind of symbiosis. Mm. As soon as you separated yes. them, the bugs, uh, mm. you, know, you had these infestations and uh, plagues and things of these mm. bugs that it took about a hundred years before oh, it all yes, fell apart. Yes. But to start with, great yeah. results it became a model for everybody uh, to use that's why we're in so much trouble yeah and but we yeah, that's do what this dazzles people that, that's, that's what dazzles people that's what dazzles people on a mm. Mm. yeah but we're, yeah that's but people get is, dazzled just, by the initial mean, success you see um yeah one of one of the things that i've argued is that um one example of this trying to reduce complexity down is um, the idea of truth. Now, 
um, truth is actually a very complicated thing because if you say something like, you know, is um, a Shakespeare play true? If you have this belief that something is either true or it's false, either true or an illusion, then Shakespeare plays are rubbish because, you know, we don't know that uh, Julius Caesar said those actual words, you know. Um, there's a clock in, in Julius Caesar, the play, and they didn't have clocks, you know, things like that. You could tear the whole thing to part. But on the other hand, it contains very great truth. You can learn things about human governance and leadership by studying Shakespeare plays because they've got immense human truth in them. Now, people have reduced truth to this thing as just a, it's just a binary state. Either something's true or it's false. And that has um, damaged discourse enormously um, because, you see, if you, a politician, if your only way of judging the value of um, Trump is to say, is what he's saying true or is it false? And you make up your mind that what he's saying is true, then when it begins to break down and not work, um, you've decided that what he says is true. Therefore, it must mean that it's been sabotaged by other people. It must be that, you know, if things don't work out like he said they would, it must be the Democrats are sabotaging it or foreigners or something like that. You know, that um, uh, again, it's the cult thing. If you only have this binary thing, it's true or false, you're either in the true cult or, or, or you're false. And um, the whole, whereas if you're not in that, you can say, mm, I quite like some of the ideas of Brexit or whatever. And if it finds it's not working, you then say, well, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't completely true. You know, I, it was my choice to go that way. And I'm now changing my choice because I no longer believe in it. Um, whereas if you got this thing of, well, I decided it was true and therefore it must be other people sabotaging it. You're just you're locked in the cult, you know. It's, um, so, yeah, that's very that's one very fundamental thing of just reducing the whole complexity of truth into a true false illusion f truth binary um, is part of that well, extreme version of that, I'd say. Well, so then if you ask a question which people don't often ask is, is what is the structure of complexity that most uh, kind of, I think the, the science scientists would say that, well, it's random and mm. they never really define what random is. Random is the stupidest concept known to man. There's no such thing as random. It all depends. Mm. You know, people like Gregory Chaitin have, have actually shown this mathematically, in fact, that it all depends on the process that, that generated it. It's the only way to, to determine if a string of, of bits is random. So you say, what structure does the universe have underneath it, if any? And I think I come to the conclusion that it's it's fractal. It's it's never really resolved. So if you go back to Cantor and, and he obsessed about the continuum hypothesis, it was is is the u universe continuous and analog, or is it digital? Are the atoms right? Which which one is it? And he drove himself mad. He put himself in an insane asylum because it, it basically he could prove one and then he could disprove it. And he, he never got the insight is you can prove it either way and you can carry on. It's just part of a dialogue that never resolves. And what do you call a system yeah, like yeah. that? You call it fractal. So what mm -hmm. the reason why there's no truth or falsehood is because you've got to say over what time period. So in other words, it, it's, it's like um, Nixon went and met Mao in Beijing and um, Nixon asked, said, you know, well, do you think the French Revolution was a good thing or a bad thing? And Mao said, mm. too early to tell. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's it. It's like, when do you tell? It's basically, we, we just arbitrarily say, well, you know, mm. the day after the French Revolution, it was a great thing. The day after that, mm. it was might have been a terrible thing. 30 years down the road, it's a good <laughs> yes, thing yeah. again. And basically, there's, there's yeah. a lot, there are a lot oh, of yeah. Zen stories to say that you mm. you, you have to pick a, fr a time frame to say whether it was good and bad, and that's arbitrary. Mm. Therefore, mm. good and evil is arbitrary. Ethics is Oh, bullshit. yes, yes. So, well, you see, I, I've, I've railed against the idea of truth as a binary state, but actually in the past, you know, going back to Bhagavad Gita and, and earlier, um, it was the good, the beautiful, and the true 
were actually three parameters for human decisions. And they weren't like three orthogonal things because, you know, the, the Greeks would say something like, um, it can't be true, uh, can't be really beautiful unless there's truth in it, you know, and it must also be goodness. That's, so rather like the fractal thing, they're actually, um, they're like directions, but, uh, you know, the, they're not like separate categories, if you like, good, the beautiful and true. And what you've been describing is people trying to make good into one of those binary things. So is it good or is it bad? Uh, we must decide where it's actually it's, it's as, as complicated a spectrum as the difference between true and false. It's, um, it's, a, you know, it's a spectrum, not a, a binary state. Well, the, but if it's if it's fractal, uh, then it's more like uh, a hologram, and it depends on your zoom level. So even beauty and truth uh, is you can zoom in. So you can zoom into beauty, and it becomes ugliness, and then zoom further, it becomes beauty again. And that's what science has found. You know, the, the standard model oh, yes, of yes. the atom is ugly. It's it, mm. it's an ugly piece of maths. It it really makes mm. physicists itch. Because they all want some beautiful equation like e equals m c squared that is like that's concise and and elegant and has masses of implications and expression, and then you get the standard model which runs for pages of pages of all this ugly bullshit oh, yeah. nonsense that just looks oh, like right, because yeah. you know mm. Escher painting, mm. and then so or rather Jackson Pollock painting, and they hate it because it's messy, it's mm. disordered, it's inelegant, it's not beautiful. Mm. But then you, oh, yes, you can yes. take the standard model, take it a bit further, and then you get back to beauty again. So it becomes mm. what's oh, the yes, zoom level? Yes. You can zoom in and out on this infinite, uh, this infinite yes. um, yeah, self-similar yes. horizon. Yes, you, you could look at a cancer cell and see what a marvelous piece of life it is. You know, the way it multiplies, things like that. Absolutely brilliant. Then you come out and you see the damage it's doing. <laughs> and then, and then you come out further and you realize that um, this is this is initiating important research into things. So, yeah, all these different layers. Well, well just on that note, well, just on that note, yesterday I was watching this guy, a very interesting uh, thing about, you know, the current, current pandemic. And what mm. he basically had examined all the patents and he's kind of making the case for this this whole idea of, uh, of COVID is imaginary. And the reason was, was something fascinating, interesting from this point of view of, the, of what we're just discussing now. He says, if you go back to all the papers and the patents, people are identifying, say, these variants, like the Delta variant. They say, this is the signature. And they take a little snippet out of the, the RNA sequence. And they say, that's oh, yeah. the signature. But he, he says, if you just take it a little bit longer, it's bullshit. You say you could, if you take it a little bit longer, you can find oh, yeah. it in a common flu virus. And so basically, if oh, you yes. take it a little bit shorter, then it's in everything. So it's basically, oh, yeah. it's just the fact that you set the, the, you just identified 12, say, sequences, and you say those are unique, and that's, and give it a name. It says it's just the fact that you made the frame that big. Make it a different mm. size, and what you're saying is nonsense. There is no, oh, and so, yeah. so, and he's saying all the way down to the machines because the machines basically mm -hmm. the way we do uh gene sequencing is we snip all the rna up into these little frames and then we use basically this um uh cosmo base whatever they conglomerate them back together again and they look in a database they basically find a little sequence like this they look in the database and they keep on adding it up but what they're doing computationally is basically nonsense in terms of the frames. It's basically also oh, yeah. setting a false frame. So it's it's mm. the, the mere fact that the the variant exists is how you frame it. But we don't say that. We say like, oh, if you if you don't say the delta variant exists, you're a conspiracy theorist and say, no, it's just how you frame it. Even oh, a cancer yeah. cell yeah. is is mm. just how you frame mm. it. Yeah. So, but a yeah. anyway, I've got to say one, one thing here. Um, uh, how much time do you have, by the way? Um, well, I'm just looking at, we've just been over an hour. Um, I have got things I need to get on with this morning, like making lunch. So okay. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. okay. So, so uh, yeah. 
I'll, I'll, I'll just finish on this this one thing. So, but I've got to I've got to show you this um, spreadsheet I made to illustrate this point, um, and it's it's so crucial. I think you you might be. I don't think many people understand it, but I think you one might be a person that would understand it. And I'll what try. it is is it's just well. What what it is 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 just a um, a Rochambeau, you know, rock paper scissors game. So oh, if you yes. say the yeah. truth or all this adversarial stuff is just a rock paper scissors game, rock Rochambeau. You say who is winning? So uh, basically, say who wins. And the spreadsheet, I won't tell you how I I did it, um, but it's a random sequence of wins. It's just random sequence of A plays rock, B. B plays paper, therefore A wins. Next oh, round. Yes. And you just go through all the rounds, 52 sequences that are entirely random. Mm. And here's where mm. the gold comes out. Say, who wins the sequence? Well, it depends on how you frame it. And the way I constructed it, I won't tell you how, was the mm. that if you say the frame is just every single round, then you say, okay, in the first round, A wins. The second round, B wins. And you carry on like that. If you say, well, no, the win is over two frames. Well, then suddenly the first round is win by B. The next round is win by A. It becomes the exact opposite. So you say oh, yeah. if, it's, if it's framed as every single tournament is a win, then A wins. If you say no, it's a oh, game yeah. of with a frame of two, then B wins. A frame of three, oh, yeah. A wins again. A frame of four, B wins again. And I go through up to 52 we're 52, 52 mm. A wins again. So I said, this random sequence, it's not really random, it's crypto random, but anyway. But you said this random sequence of wins shows that if A or B wins, it's entirely how you frame it. So the, mm. the deeper insight is there's never a point where you can set the frame as an absolute say, this is the frame, this is, what we, this is the meter, mm. and we're going to use that mm. to determine truth. And you say, if you oh, do yes, that, yes. I can always get a double meter or some other measurement that says you're wrong. And that's why these people are insane. Uh, yeah. They're going to kill us all. Oh, yeah. That's, um, yeah, because that's sort of extending it. The, the, the basic idea of sampling in order to take a reading um, must be like that, mustn't it? You know, how, how big is your sample? Because um, you decide on a certain sample size. Um, uh, I don't know, in a forestry, it might be um, tree by tree and you get certain results. Whereas if you look at groups of three trees, you might get a, a very different result. Yes, it's, it's, um, I think that's a very fundamental problem, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. The, well, was, I, I knew you would understand. There's, uh, nobody really mm. understands this. <laughs> so, but think about it. Mm. If you made your sample size one and you, had, you just looked mm. at uh, one tree, you'd get an entirely different result. But you say, well, how big is a forest? It's like, it's a nonsense mm. question. I, I can mm. say, look at, uh, you know, say the new forest in England and I say, why is that separate from some forest, the Württemberg forest in Germany? Like nature thinks mm. they're all the same forest. It's you that decided the new forest is this and this. Oh, yes, and then yes. you frame it like that, you'll get some result. But I mean, mm. nature doesn't see it that way. Nature sees all forests connected. Mm. It doesn't have those frames. So we're coming up yeah. with these bullshit answers. But, and but this we're coming was, back this to the shown. coming back to the very beginning thing, which is the again, a sample of one is the individual. The whole is the group. So we're sort of back to that that initial problem we were facing, wasn't it? The individual and the group, or the individual and the whole. But what's the group? What's the group? The group mm. is the universal. Mm. Nature says the group is infinite. Mm. So we're, ba we're back to Cantor and we're back to the, the problem of irrationals is, is, is mm -hmm. what, what you said earlier, that the irrational numbers, although we only know of about 12, uh, Cantor proved that there were infinitely more irrational numbers mm. than rational, which is weird oh, because yeah. we know an infinite number of rational numbers and only about 12 irrational. But he plainly yeah. showed well, that's that the irrational numbers a, a, are so a, a, huge that it a, means a, the rational ones yeah. are irrelevant. Mm, it's, yeah, it's, Aleph uh, zero, they yeah. call it Aleph zero and Aleph one, isn't it? That's the difference. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Aleph one is infinitely bigger than Aleph zero. Yeah. But yes. um, but it, but and, it, it and means that Aleph zero mm. is meaningless. Yeah. Yes. And if you sort of say Aleph zero 
times alef zero like two dimensions it's still tiny compared with alef one you know it's a, you, you can have it's well well you to being uncountable power, and to, to the power if mm. you start, yeah if you if you start yes. stacking the powers yeah. of, of alef and that's that's yes. pretty much what drove that Cantor much. Mao, I think, was doing, <laughs> doing this arithmetic. Gosh, yes. But anyway, yeah. anyway the, the, the mathematicians came out of that and said, well, we, this is a pathology in mathematics, which we hope will mm. heal itself. And I think it's the other way around. I think it's, it's <laughs> the beauty of that is uh, mathematics is the pathology, which I think will heal itself yeah. by making us go step. Perhaps that's why I moved from maths into magic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah the it's, it's, it's uh, I think new, you're following in the footsteps of Newton, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, well, it's it's been wonderful talking to you. Um, yes, uh, could go on yes. a long time, I think, but it better not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, would you like to do it again uh, sometime? Yes, yes, it would be a pleasure. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, well, let's um, let me put this one up and and uh, get back to you, and I'll 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 send you that uh, spreadsheet. I'll dig it out and, and send it to you. So maybe that's a discussion point for the next thing. But it's re uh, remarkably uh, good to to hear what you have to say, and it's been quite a thrill for me yeah. <laughs> to discover you. So thank yeah. you very much for this. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you. It's been fascinating. Okay. So yeah, and, good uh, sailing. Take I'll care say. and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, take care in South Africa, which is going a bit chaotic. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay.